right. You can all see that hopefully and all hear me. Any thumbs up from Pakula? Yep. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much everyone for attending. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. I've never um, done a Zoom talk before, so this could all go horribly wrong, especially if my internet cuts out, but uh, well, well, let's hope it all, it all goes fine. So um, I want to talk to you today about some of the research that our group's done over the last few years in uh, making compounds that you can actually use <clears throat> to store data on so single molecule magnets. Uh, and I'll explain what that is uh, very soon. Um, so we start with this nice blueprint design and I'll just click on to the next slide to sort of say, well, why would you even want to make a high density data storage device? You know, what, what even is the point? Well, basically the economy, now you obviously know that electronic devices, there's a real trend to miniaturize them and that's been going on for some years. So a couple of pictures from before all of our time here. Uh, here's from 1944, the Colossus II uh, supercomputer was uh, used to crack the Lorentz cipher and it took up an entire room. Uh, that's how big computers were back then. Uh, then this is a picture from 2016. Uh, this is a kangaroo desktop computer, that thing there that looks like an external hard drive or a mouse. Uh, you know, and it's basically the same size as a peanut butter sandwich. It's ridiculous how much smaller we've made computers. What about mobile phones? Well, if we look at our films, so this is Wall Street, 1987, you can see that, you know, Michael Douglas there sporting quite a large mobile phone. You go to Zoolander in 2001 and they're, they're like tiny tiny mobile phones obviously they're a bit bigger now but the mobile phones we use these days are the size are basically miniature computers so we want technology to be smaller there's a huge drive for it uh, and in fact this has been predicted for some time if you go back to 1965 the co-founder of intel gordon moore um, found that if you looked at the trend and how much smaller devices had gone then basically they managed to double the amount of components on a on an integrated circuit every year and basically that's continued to happen for the last 50 years. And in the meantime, people have started calling this uh, Moore's Law. So this has slowed a little bit, but basically there's a doubling uh, every two and a half years. So we're making devices smaller and smaller, and this has been going on relatively evenly for half a century. So you can look this up yourself on, on Wikipedia. So basically if you go from left to right from the 70s to 2011 in this graph, you do a logarithmic scale on how much how much is doubled and you can see we're a nice straight line so fantastic the problem is that actually we might not be able to continue at this um, rate of progression and we might even reach a plateau and this is disastrous in, in a number of ways but basically the the way the data economy works is we have to keep this trend going uh, why might it plateau well the reason is that what we're trying to do is do a, a top-down approach we're trying to etch smaller and smaller components onto silicon chip semiconductors and there's going to be a physical limit to that where we're etching smaller and smaller and eventually the two uh, components are going to meet each other and then obviously they're not separate and that's going to be an issue. So one, one of the alternatives that people are looking at are these bottom-up approaches. Can you make a smaller unit that can contain data and the current technologies and can we go the opposite direction and make really really small devices uh, and one of these um, potential uh, ways to get there is a single molecule magnet so molecules are obviously tiny great um, and if you can store a bit of data or one or a zero on a single molecule that's going to be thousands of times smaller than you could ever achieve by etching on silicon chips so great can we then store a one or a zero on a molecule then can we then obviously even harder make a device from it we're the chemists so we're interested in the molecular part designing single molecule magnets so molecules that can uh, store store data they've been uh, proposed they've been known since 1993 so the fields are nearly 30 years old now uh, and people said well maybe we could use these for data storage even back then um, so the, the classical definition of a single molecule magnet is basically that you can exhibit magnetic hysteresis of a purely molecular origin. So what that means is that it's the molecule that holds the data and it isn't the interaction of molecules with other molecules that um, does a, has a long range order in the store data. That's how a uh, traditional uh, hard drive works. This is going to be completely different. So what's magnetic hysteresis? Well, it's essentially magnetic memory. So if you apply a magnetic field, the sample remembers that field and it keeps that magnet, magnetic data. So we can visualize this with a diagram and hopefully my 
most will show up here. So if you start with a sample with no magnetic field, um, then you can what you can do is you can sweep that field, apply a field, and it becomes magnetized. When you then sweep the field back, if you don't go back to zero, then you've got remnant magnetization, as in it's remembered that you've magnetized it. And this sort of open loop is magnetic hysteresis. If the loop closes, then there is no magnetic hysteresis. So basically, can you keep a sample in a one or a zero state, a one or a, or a up or a down, or however thinking of molecular spins? And that's exactly how hard disk drive works, you know, a binary one or a zero. So we have to magnetize the sample, and it has to hold that magnetic memory. It can't just relax back to forgetting because that's not memory, that's forgetting, and that's what happens to me all the time these days, uh, not molecules. Okay, so great, sounds fantastic. So why aren't we using them? Uh, why aren't they in our computers? Well, just because the current single molecule magnets we've been using, they need a massive amount of cooling to make them work. Um, so typically we need liquid helium. Now, liquid helium's got a boiling point of four Kelvin, so that's about as cold as you can get. And that's just not a viable way of, you can't be keeping liquid helium in your house. Uh, for one thing, that's no good. Um, we need to make, we need to basically make this hotter. And in fact, helium's just ridiculously expensive anyway. You basically normally get it from, you know, extracting natural gas uh, and fossil fuels, which is obviously a finite resource and not particularly good for the environment. And then when you use uh, helium, it's light and it just floats away into outer space. So that's not good either. You know, that, that, that basically means it's a finite resource and it's expensive. So what can we do? Well, maybe we can increase the block this, this blocking temperature, as we call it, the temperature at which magnetic data is stored above 77 Kelvin. That's going to be our first target, liquid nitrogen. Now, liquid nitrogen is cheap and plentiful. So yes, it'd be great for it to be stable above 300 Kelvin. So 298 Kelvin is room temperature. That would be great. But you know, baby steps. We're we're trying to do something first. And obviously, I'm again not suggesting we're going to be all into having liquid nitrogen in our own houses. But uh, you could imagine a data storage center like Google. Uh, perhaps you know, if you could make a, a huge data storage center a thousand times smaller. That'd be fantastic, you know, and they would happily use liquid nitrogen on that facility than use a thousand times the amount of energy by having a building a thousand times the size. So it's not such a crazy idea. So this is going to be quite Manchester focused. I've actually seen in the audience we've got some fantastic single molecule magnet people in the audience. Um, th this is obviously a Manchester focused talk. This is a, an example. Uh, collaboration between uh, collaborators in China uh, and people at Manchester to, to measure this dysprosium single molecule magnet. And this was, a, this was a world record holder in 2016 because it had a huge barrier to magnetic reversal. So basically the amount of energy it takes to, to, to go over a magnetic barrier to go between one and zero or plus up and down. Um, but this didn't show magnetic memory above 14 Kelvin. So that's still far too, too low. We need to get that temperature up. So I'm just gonna focus on this molecule uh, this dysprosium molecule here, and I'll give a little bit of a talk about that. So I know there's all ranges uh, of chemistry experience in the audience, and I want to try and explain what this picture on this slide means. Okay, so uh, we'll just give it a medal, uh, because it was a record holder in 2016. So it's been surpassed in the meantime uh, by, by a number of molecules, but we'll talk about them now. Okay, the good news is that scientists have been very busy in the single molecule magnet area long before I uh, started investigating them and my, my group. So basically there was a review in 2011 that said, well, we actually know how to make better single molecule magnets and perhaps single molecule magnets that are stable above 77 Kelvin. And okay, it's the, the whole the whole um, theory of magnetism is quite complicated. I'm not going to go into the fine details of it. I want to stick to the chemistry rather than the physics for this talk. But basically, you can imagine that if you heat up a sample, it's going to have more energy, and that would then have more energy to relax, and then and then that relaxation will stop it from holding its magnetism. Let's just do a very simple idea like that. So basically, we, should, we just want to try and make that barrier to, to thermal relaxation lower. So let's consider this 2016 work record. Why was it so good? Why did it have high barrier? And maybe then how can we make it better? 
Well, first of all, uh, the most important thing is that it contains a lanthanide. Uh, this is dysprosium right in the middle. Um, lanthanides are great for single molecule magnets because they've got lots of unpaired electrons and they're paramagnetic. You need something that has unpaired electrons. Uh, that's, that's criteria number one. Lanthanides are great because they have lots of unpaired electrons. And so if you apply a magnetic field, uh, then this, this unpaired uh, spin can align with the field. And that basically gives you the, the magnetization that I showed earlier. Okay, why is dysprosium one of, so lanthanides, there's 14 of them. Uh, dysprosium is actually one of the best. It's just got one, this ideal combination of properties uh, to give it this optimal magnetic anisotropy or, or sort of direction dependence, basically. Uh, we'll go into that now in a bit. So what about this directional dependence? Well, they find that different lanthanides are stabilized, or their, mag their magnetic states are stabilized by different compound geometries. So, and the reason for that is that um, the, the magnetic states of dysprosium point in different directions. The most magnetic state of dysprosium uh, is, an, is uh, as I'll show now, um, can be stabilized by this axial ligand field. So basically what that means is, this is an axis from top to bottom. I've got these oxygen donors on the top and the bottom. They're very strong donors. And around the middle of the molecule, so I've tried drawing it in 3D, I hope I've done a good job, uh, these pyridine ligands are very weak. And that difference in, um, in basically strong and weak ligand fields make it uh, very magnetic. So there's a, there's a diagram. So basically the, the most magnetic state is an oblate spheroid, that's on the right, and the least magnetic state is a prolate spheroid. So anything that you squash down on this, this, pro, this oblate spheroid, it makes it more and more wider and more anisotropic and that makes it more stable. And if you push down on the prolate uh, spheroid, which is this least magnetic state, that destabilizes that. So it basically makes a bigger barrier. And that, that's the simple way of how it works. So, so arrows on the top and the bottom show you that. We're trying to push basically. And actually what we'd really like to make is a dysprosium compound that only has one donor on the top and one donor on the bottom, and none of these pesky donors around the middle because that would give the ultimate stabilization of, of the most magnetic state. Sounds simple, but it isn't simple. And the reason is that it's very hard to make a two corner dysprosium compound. And I'll try and explain why now. Uh, but first of all, we've got this uh, crack team of scientists at Manchester that we put together, which is sort of like the A team, but not because we're, we're scientists. So I guess we're the M team, the magnet team. Um, so we got a grant from the, U from the UK government, the Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council a few years ago. And these other four scientists at Manchester and myself put forward a grant uh, to get some money to investigate this. Uh, and this is a, a, my research group at the time uh, that do all the chemistry while we sit in the office um, or at or home these days uh, <laughs> and think about things. So uh, thanks very much to the EPSLC for funding this research. So, for the lanthanides, I mean, just to give a, a general overview of the lanthanides, because a lot of you don't know much about them already, they've been investigated for many years. So there's this, this row at the bottom of the periodic table. They're, um, they're fantastic. They, they, they are very, put, very not very been explored very much, but um, they've got amazing physical properties, optical and magnetic. So actually they've been used in batteries, speakers, headphones, and every smartphone you've got in your possession will contain lanthanides. So they're massively important to today's technological society. Uh, here's an example of a Toyota car, uh, the Prius hybrid that was released uh, about 10 years back. And within a few years, they managed to sell over 2 million of these. Each of them contains over nine kilograms of lanthanides. So I'd say that's you know, pretty important, even though you might not have encountered them too much in the past. A bit, a bit of lanthanide chemistry 101. So I just want to just give a little bit of a taut material just to say, well, what, what can we learn from the lanthanides about this talk? And then can we apply it to this research problem to make a two-coordinate two dysprosium compound? Well, first of all, lanthanides are electropositive um, and they like to bond to highly electronegative elements. So basically they're called oxophilic. They like to bond to the elements in the top right of the periodic table most of all, like oxygen, fluorine, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Lanthanides are large. Uh, that basically means that they try and fit as many atoms around as they can. They don't like only having two atoms attached, and they actually prefer to have 9, 10, 11, 12, as many as they can fit. 
Um, this is called a coordination number, um, and that's what we're trying to avoid when we make our low coordinate um, axial systems. So the coordination number of the compound I showed earlier is seven. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, that's low. We want to go lower than that. Um, for those of you who do, do a bit of, who know a bit of chemistry, they like to they'd be in this plus three oxidation state. That's a term for how the ionization state of these elements. And it's difficult to access other states quite often. So this dysprosium is in the plus three oxidation state. And you can count that yourself by saying these pyridines are neutral. These oxygens on the top and the bottom are minus one each. And the amine is also minus one. So that's, that's how you work that out. So these are ligands, and we need to make a ligand that's big enough, basically, to stop any other ligands from getting close. That's, that's what we need to do. That's, that's lanthanide chemistry 101. If we want to make a two coordinate dysprosium compound, we've got to make the other ligands so big that no other ligands can get close. And that's, that's the challenge. So here's some pictures of some typical lanthanide compounds. So they like to be eight or nine coordinate quite often. They make these large regular shapes, but we don't want a regular shape. We want an anisotropic irregular shape. People have been doing this for many years before us. There's some examples here from the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Fantastic chemistry. You can make these two corner compounds. It's just extremely difficult. And I, I think I've got about five minutes left to, to talk about how you might do this, and I'll, I'll just give an overview now. How you need large ligands, first of all. But secondly, you need special techniques because they're so oxophilic, these lanthanides. If there's any oxygen or water around, um, basically it just they'll just bind with oxygen or water and the coordination number goes up. So we need to basically avoid that completely. So we use all this specialist kit. We use these Schlenk flasks, which is a specialist glassware, and Schlenk lines named after the discoverer of Wilhelm Schlenk back in the 19th century. And we need to perform our manipulations under argon. So we avoid water, oxygen completely. Sounds uh, wacky. This is what a Schlenk flask looks like. Basically, we use this sort of key and tap design to make sure that everything inside the flask is just argon and our compound, and everything outside obviously is, is air, which is 20% oxygen and lots of water vapor. You attach this to all these tubings, and that makes uh, that, that, that's your Schlenk line, and that allows you to do these reactions using this and keeping everything away from oxygen and water. Um, and then what, when you've made it, then what do you do with these compounds? We have to store them somewhere. Uh, we store our compounds in something called a glove box. Um, they cost around £35,000 uh, typically, which is really uh, basically makes them a very expensive cupboard. This is what they look like. You can see there are little port doors on the outside to take compounds in and out, sort of like an airlock on a spaceship. Uh, then on the inside, you've got these uh, rubber gloves that you can then work inside. So everything inside that box doesn't contain water or moisture. Uh, and then you can take things in and out and manipulate them. So that's, uh, that's how you do. And the reason we have to be so careful is the things we make want oxygen and water so much that when they do see it, it can be so energetically burst into flames. And those of you familiar with these periodic table of videos should check this one out. This is the zinc flamethrower, basically getting some diethyl zinc in a syringe and squirting it, and it makes a, a flamethrower. So we want to avoid this. We, want to, we don't want our compounds to burn. We want to make them and study them. OK, so, so coming to the crux of it, how do you make a good ligand? Well, we like to think in Manchester we've been inspired by the weather, which is, which is terrible. Um, which means that we need umbrellas. This is your essential bit of kit in Manchester. Um, so an umbrella obviously has a handle, a shaft, and a canopy. So we think that the bigger the canopy, um, as in the bigger the ligand, the more protected you are from the rain. Sort of, that's the analogy. So we need big umbrellas if we want to make a two coordinate compound. Uh, this picture hopefully illustrates that entirely. This lady on the right understands ligand design very well. She's a lanthanide with a very, very large umbrella not getting wet. Great. Uh, the gentleman uh, on the left um, just doesn't have a clue really about ligand design. I mean that, that ligand is nowhere near large enough for him and he is soaked. Uh, and then what my group have found over the last few years is just you can find all sorts of silly um, pictures of umbrellas um, and that, that's basically that slide. So um, one of the results that my group contributed to this field, which is a, a vibrant field, it's got many results that I don't have time to talk about today, was uh, we reported an axial dysprosium compound in 2017 that exhibited magnetic memory at 60 Kelvin. So that's not 77 Kelvin, that's not quite where we want it to be. 
and obviously, and also I will admit that the it only stores magnetic memory for a vanishingly small amount of time at 60 Kelvin, not long enough, but you know, a big step in the right direction. You can see this compound, we call it dysprosocelium, is highly axial, um, and, and that makes it a really good single molecule magnet. So we followed the design criteria previously, but we also found something else when we made this compound, which we didn't expect. And that is that these ligands that we've used to make this pseudo two coordinate compound, it isn't really two coordinate, uh, as many of the audience of you will know, um, but it's, it's basically these compound, these ligands are quite rigid. And that rigidity reduces the amount of molecular vibrations. And since the molecular vibrations were responsible for some of the magnetic relaxation processes, it basically made it a much higher temperature than it had been achieved previously. And using the design criteria that we set, other researchers have now even achieved hysteresis at 80 Kelvin. So hysteresis has now been achieved at above 77. What we're trying to do now is make even more rigid systems to make this stay magnetized for a longer amount of time. Because yeah, it's all very well and good to say we can get to 80 Kelvin now, but again, these times are vanishingly small. We need to store data for a longer amount of time. Otherwise it's just forgetting, uh, which I can do without using a single molecule magnet. Okay, so I think that my 20 minutes are up. Um, what I've done here is I've put together a selection of slides from people in the department. So, um, Dekula or Paige, just wanna get one of you off mute a second. Hello? Um, hello. Hi. Um, just to say, um, so do you want me to wrap up now or should I just spend a few minutes just going through some of the people in the, the inorganic section that I haven't had a chance to cover today? Oh no, please feel free to cover. Like, I mean, I see you have Alan Brisbane up there. I'm sure okay, everyone yeah, wanna yeah. hear about him. Okay, yeah, fantastic. Okay, so um, thanks Paige. Okay, so I'll just carry on for a few more minutes and then I'll, I'll take any, any questions and answers at that point. Basically, we've got all sorts of fantastic researchers at Manchester. I've just been focusing on some of the, the, the work that my group did today. Um, it's a very large department with a lot of researchers. I just represent the inorganic section, which is one sixth of the staff at Manchester. We've got Alan Brisson's group here, who do fantastic chemistry with fluorine, whether it's to do with organometallics or organics or pharmaceuticals. As you can see, you can, you can see this slide yourself and read it, but basically fluorine, changing hydrogen atoms of fluorine makes all sorts of amazing differences to molecules. And uh, Alan's group focus on that, that replacement and getting all these wonderful applications out of them. We've got this other uh, lovely group um, headed by Siha Yang in the inorganic section and Martin Schroeder, who's from the material section, also the Dean of Science uh, and Engineering at Manchester. They make these um, framework materials, which are sort of like um, climbing frames, I like to think. Basically, uh, frameworks are very large open spaces in them. And you can see that what they've applied these, uh, these two is, um, is like, uh, gas storage and, and even removing toxic uh, chemicals from from um, from industrial processes. So the, these metal organic frameworks, as they as they call, do these fantastic gas uh, and separations technologies. Uh, we have Steve Liddell, who's the head of inorganic section. His group also focuses in F element chemistry, uh, but also that of the early of the early D elements and. And as, as, as Steve's written here, making molecules that, can't ex that shouldn't exist. I mean, it's fun research to make molecules that people say are very difficult to make. You can, you can do all these sort of catalysis applications, again, magnetism, electronic structure. And you can see that they've done all sorts of things with dinitrogen, for example, and making these uranium nitrides. So like mimics of nuclear fuels and mimics of Harbour Bosch processes, which are used to make ammonia, which basically feeds the planet through the, pro the, the production of ammonia for fertilizer. So some, fun some fundamental research here as well. Uh, this is my own group, so I'm not gonna talk about them anymore, apart from say this is the most recent photo in the bottom right corner, uh, which was obviously taken by Zoom, because uh, that was the only way of doing it. So they're, they're a great bunch. Uh, they do all the work and I just sit around in my living room. Um, and then we have uh, Louise Natrajan's group, a wonderful group that I have a pleasure of sharing a lab with Louise and her, and her group. They're, they're really a, amazing F element chemists as well. They're interested in the optical property of, of F elements. So basically, we're, we're talking about magnetism today, but the lanthanides and actinides have these wonderful optical properties as well. And Louise's group are really interested, sorry, um, in investigating how these optical properties can be used to sense these lanthanides. So whether it's in the body, in a biological application, or whether it's even sensing uranium 
uh, found in the environment uh, by looking at how uranium is uptaken by bacteria and so on and so forth, just using spectroscopy, so visible light. So that's uh, fantastic. Um, the last of the, the, the most alphabetical is Darren Wilcox's research group. Darren's a new member of staff. Uh, he's interested in, again, in, in this fundamental molecular chemistry. He's looking at iron compounds to do catalysis because most catalysis is done with expensive precious metals. And we need to find cheaper ways of doing catalysis, like using an abundant metal like iron. Uh, and also looking at some, uh, some interesting sort of applied chemistry and mimics of well-known uh, chemical reactivity, like using Grignard reagents, but, but switching it around a bit. The ones that I, uh, I haven't um, got a slide for, but just to show that there are another bunch of researchers uh, in, in our section that uh, this is the last slide for the, the acknowledgements, by the way. Uh, Francis Livens, who's an expert at radiochemistry, looking at radionuclides made in nuclear fuel cycles. Mira Mehta, who's our, another new member of staff, interested in zintel chemistry, so making uh, molecular chemistry of p-block clusters. Uh, Imogen Riddell, uh, who does whose, whose group investigates supramolecular chemistry? So, for example, using cages and porous materials like the previous Yang sugar group, but more molecular and trapping biomolecules, for example. So, being able to store enzymes outside of a, a of a living organism. Uh, so that's that's a, a lovely lovely bit of research that Imogen's group do. Uh, David Collison, Eric McInnes, and Floriana Tuna, pictured here, uh, are part of this magnets group. So they're the, they're the real experts at magnetism. My group is a synthetic chemistry group. We make these, these compounds and they use the, these, we call the National EPR service. They, they study these systems by that and using this superconducting quantum interference device or SQUID uh, to study them as well. So I hope I've given an overview of what we do in the section. Uh, so this was a picture of my group a few years ago. They all did all the work. So I'd like to thank all them uh, and, and obviously all the people who did various help, funders of funding and Obviously, my, my usual life inspiration from Bill S. Press and Esquire, Ted Theodore, Logan and Dude, uh, and thanks to, to everyone who's contributed. And thanks very much for taking the time out of your days to, to come and see this talk, and I hope I can provide any information uh, that would be interesting to you. Thanks very much. So, uh, over to our chairs. So, I think we'll go for the uh, question and answer sessions. Um, no? So, um, Ellie and Amrita. Okay, so should I stop sharing my screen maybe? Is that best? Or I'll leave, I'll leave it shared yeah. just in case I want to show a slide, so yes. Hi, yeah, I think Hi. we've got one question here. Um, it says, um, it asks, will undergraduate students be allowed to take part in any kind of research at the university? Uh, yeah, fantastic, yeah, definitely. So um, we have a different number of different um, chemistry programs at Manchester. If people are really want to do research as an undergraduate and do a lot of it, the one I'd recommend most is the four-year course, um, so an, an MChem course. That way your entire fourth year is spent doing research in one of the groups at Manchester as part of the research group. And that's basically both semesters of, of the final year. And, um, and, and it's basically worth, you know, 80% of the credits of that year as well. So it's that's the one to do. There are plenty of opportunities before that as well. So uh, in the third year, there are group projects um, and that's in common for all students if they do a BSc or a master's. Uh, and that's working in a group of four with an academic to do research um, as part of a team. Um, and that takes up basically all of semester two of labs in, in, uh, in third year. And even if people are interested before that, there are opportunities for summer projects. So if people want to spend eight weeks of the summer, they can apply for bursaries to work in a research group uh, during the breaks between semesters. So, so yeah, a lot of opportunities. If, if people are, if any undergraduates interested uh, in doing some research, all we have to do is approach an academic member of staff and say, I'm interested in this research in your group, can I get involved? And uh, we'll try and help out. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I think we've got another question from an undergraduate. Um, she's asked, uh, what inspired you to get into this area of chemistry and what advice would you give um, to the new young chemists? Oh, right. <laughs> A big, big question. I'll, I'll do my best um, to, give, to give my perspective. Uh, everyone's, I guess, got their own take on this. So, so the first part of the question, what got me into this? Um, 
I've always just been, I've always just followed what I found the most exciting. Uh, and people, that's going to be a very personal thing. I love the idea of making compounds that just seemed very difficult to make and even maybe seemed impossible. And I followed that a long way. And I, I, I didn't do my PhD in F element chemistry. I did it in P block and D block chemistry. So different areas of the periodic table. It was only in my postdoc I ended up doing F element chemistry when I was actually working with Steve Little uh, in Nottingham. So that was number one. I think always follow what you're most enthusiastic about and, and my enthusiasm of making difficult things. And for the F elements, I found a, a sort of a new, a new love of, of that era of the periodic table later than I did because obviously I was doing P and D block before that, just because they're so under investigated. You know, there's so many things to discover there that have already been discovered for the D and P block. So the F elements in particular just got these fascinating properties that we don't actually really understand. And, and that's really fun get in to understand these these new properties that people didn't discover before and to answer the second part of the uh, question so would it be like if i have any advice is that it for, for yes yes yeah. so so that's, that's a bigger question i obviously it's difficult times for everyone at the moment and i and i, and I, I can acknowledge especially for, for younger chemists that, that that's uh, and people getting into chemistry that's really hard so first of all just stay positive um it's a tough time for everyone and things might take a, a bit longer to get to where we want to go uh, than previously. Um, if you're interested in research, I, I'd, I'd recommend going to a research intensive university because you'll have the maximum choices of research projects to get into. Um, obviously do your, do your homework, think about where you want to live, where you want to go, and even later on when you think about things like PhDs, who you want to work with, you know, who you'd enjoy working with, you know, it's, it's, it's basically because it's a lot of hard work and most of it is trying to it basically come in with a smile on your face every morning being enthusiastic even when things are tough so i'd always say just do yeah the same advice as before just just pick something that you really enjoy and that will always be your motivation even when things aren't as easy um don't, okay. i've got another question uh this one message but is a lanthanide always occupied with its maximum coordination number? And if so, for a compound like dysprosium, does there need to be more than one ligand to provide an umbrella protection against their oxophilic properties? That's a very good question. Okay, so I'll, 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 since it's a good question, I'll answer it properly. So we'll go back to the coordination number slide. The coordination number, you can find this on the International Union of Applied uh, pure chemistry website there is a definition of coordination number which is basically how many sort of atoms or heteroatoms are bonded to a metal now for these examples you know you could have an example that only has a coordination number of two or three or four these are hard to make and you bet you've, you've got to be doing this in the absence of air or moisture otherwise you're going to get eight or nine basically every time you can even get up to things like 12 with like small ligands or a bidentate they get two atoms close um but the definition of coordination number is is a definition and, and actually it's much more complicated than that so where i haven't drawn on this and this is why i think it's an, a good question is that of course this lanthanide is still going to want to bond to as many atoms as it possibly can and these other groups on the ligands a, a little bit further away get as close as they can to the metal and they actually make these little contacts with the metal, electrostatic type contacts that aren't a coordination number by the strictest definition, but obviously are massively important in defining the coordination sphere. So, so that's that. The cheat thing that we've done at Manchester here and a lot of other groups around the world have done it, they're using ligands like this that don't really fit any definition of coordination number because I've drawn this dotted line to the middle of this ring. So this ring contains five carbon atoms, and there's a hole in the middle, a little hole, but that's where the electron density is. And so people sometimes call this pseudo two coordinate. I, I don't I don't really like calling it things like that really, because when you put the word pseudo in front of something, it just means not. So basically I'm just saying something that it's not. Well, obviously it's not two coordinates, it's not any of those things, but you know, it's it's axial or you know, bent or whatever you can use the word to describe that. Um, and yeah, you know, a, a CP ligand takes up around three coordination sites. So, you know, yeah, in the eye of the beholder, that, that answer. But I hope, I hope that, that gives you a good indication of what we mean. Oh, thank you, Dr. David. Um, there is another question. Uh, how can you make more ligands? Mm. 
I, I wish I knew all of the answers. Uh, it, it'd be it'd be easier. Um, so yeah, this is this is this is a really good question. How how do we do this? So one thing that we can think about is where is where is the the non rigidity in this molecule? Like where is the bulkiness? And this these these groups on the side, these terbutyl groups, they waggle around quite a bit. So when we made this molecule the first time, we also found that the things that waggled the most were actually these carbon hydrogen bonds on this these positions on the ring where there aren't terbutyl groups. So the, the part of the design criteria that we set, the community was saying, if you can make these compounds, but without, but, but you could put carbon atoms in these positions instead of hydrogen atoms, then they should be better magnets. And that, that magnet that's at 80 Kelvin follows that criteria. It's got all the carbon atoms around the ring. But now you want to make the rings more rigid. So maybe you could imagine systems where you've got a ring fused to another ring, fused to another ring, fused to another ring. So these larger fused systems and none of these terbutyl groups flopping around either. So yeah, there's a number of ways of doing it, but yeah, making it more rigid is basically to stop any of this waggling from happening. There's always going to be some, um, but yeah, we've got a lot of ideas going forward just to, to fix it into place. You can even imagine joining up different sides of the ring and making it like a prison cage, you know, to just really constrict the amount of movement it's got. So lots of exciting ideas, um, and uh, uh, not just our group are working on them, other groups are around the world. Really exciting. Thank you. Um, I came across another um, exciting question. Um, it says, um, lanthanides can also be radioactive if they're used at the industrial level. Um, so for example, SMM, uh, for, for SMM, what kind of approach are chemists able to put into solving these kinds of issues? Okay, yeah, great question. Um, I mean, the answer is that's not just a chemist's um, problem, that, that's all of science, you know? So what makes this a, such an exciting field to be in that it's also for physicists, engineers, computer systems, software surface scientists, and all sorts of different disciplines lots of things that chemists can do so first of all we're making compounds that are ridiculously uh, unstable we could help by making things that are a bit more stable that would be that would be nice um that said um what we're trying to do as chemists is is try and do some proof of concept of the next step so if we as chemists can deposit these molecules on surfaces rather than just have them as crystals that's an important step for any sort of device technology getting it onto a surface I think the real challenge for single molecule magnets is, is, is perhaps an engineering problem rather than a chemistry problem, which is, let's say we eventually put beautiful molecules on a surface in lines and it's all really stable. How do you then get a way of reading a molecule without disturbing the molecule next to it? Um, you know, th th these, these are, you know, how do you do a read-write technology? I mean, that's another big question. So yeah, chemists have a lot to do. A lot of the fun of this area isn't just the direct application is in, are we going to make a single molecule magnet, but perhaps are we going to understand these relaxation mechanisms in lanthanides well enough to then apply them to other existing F element technologies. So like, like you know, relaxation mechanisms in lanthanides are massively important for MRI scanning in, in, in medical scanning. So I think it's, it's not just the direct application, but also the, the information uh, what would you call it, platform, raising that and, and then being able to apply it is also important. So yeah, as chemists, we can have a lot of, we can have a lot of fun and, and hopefully do some useful stuff as well. We could even accidentally make something that's an amazing catalyst by doing this. That's nothing to do with magnetism. And that's, that's the joy of fundamental research. Um, okay, we have another one. Someone would like to hear a bit more about helium capture methods. Um, they want to know if it's mostly by gas diffusion or if it's captured by some reactions and separated. Okay, I'm not afraid to say that this is massively outside of my, my expertise. So I do not have a good answer for this. Um, I only know the basics, which is that helium's derived, it's all trapped and you, you get it from fossil fuel mining. Then you do um, separations procedures, and you know I'm, I'm aware enough to know that you can even separate different size helium atoms because uh, to, to do advanced cooling. Um, so you know helium is not always the isotope for. Um, as for the the sort of set, what we do have, and this is this is so that perhaps I can point the direction. In. So the National EPR Service is the experts on the single molecule magnetism, but also they have a helium recovery system. 
So to operate that superconducting magnet, they have to use liquid helium and they do recycle it and they've got a recycling loop. So there is technology available to do that and to recycle the vast majority, some of it's just still leaks because the helium atoms are so small, they basically just go through gaps between molecules on cavity walls and stuff. So yeah, outside of my expertise, but that's hopefully enough information to provide. And uh, I don't know who to, it'd be an engineer, I think would be able to answer that or a chemical engineer would give me a better answer than, than me. Uh, we've got another question. I think that will be like the last question. Um, so what are, the question is, what are the future visions in the field of organometallic catalysis? And what are the applications of catalysis in the field of medicine? So organometallic catalysis, first of all, yeah? Wow. Okay, so I actually think that it's obviously far away from the, the stuff that we're doing, but I, I think it's, it's the sort of thing that Alan would be doing uh, in his work. So, you know, taking known catalytic systems that work really well, that use precious metals, but then making them more efficient. Uh, these fluorine replacement tactics are fantastic and not many groups around the world do that. It's all about making them obviously more efficient, but then and going forward to Darren Wilcox's group, replacing these precious metals with more abundant metals. I think that's also a massive, massively important thing for organometallic uh, catalysis point of view. If it's catalysis in, in general, I think that yeah, having these sort of, so people use these metal organic frameworks for catalysis. So it doesn't just have to be organometallics and obviously heterogeneous, uh, you know, solid state uh, difference phases versus um, homogeneous catalysis, obviously just as important as the organometallic type catalysis uh, going forward. Um, if we're talking about medicine, so if you're interested, there is a, the, the chemical biological uh, chemistry group, CBBC, uh, hopefully have another talk representative and they do lots of enzyme catalysis, uh, looking at how sugars are broken down and biocatalysis, you know, and obviously enzymes are uh, to, to uh, evolved into wonderful catalysts and, and utilizing them, I think it is a good way forward uh, and they'd be able to answer questions on that uh, specifically. Yeah, I think we'll just finish it off with one more question because it's related okay. to research. Okay. And the question is, how do you exactly put data onto a molecule? Right, how do you exactly do it? I guess, yeah, that, it's a good question. That, that's sort of what I was saying earlier, that that's the engineering problem at the end of it. At the moment, we're just taking a big pile of our compound, you know, like even if it's 20 milligrams, that is so many molecules, you know, orders, 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 uh, Avogadro's number number of atoms. Um, the idea then, of, as I was saying earlier, of putting molecules onto a surface and spacing them out in a regular array, then it becomes, that's the engineering problem then, is, is, is reading a molecule on its own and not disturbing its nearest neighbor. I think that's, that, that's away from chemistry probably. I mean, we can do lattice doping, so we can separate, you know, we can have a certain percentage of a dysprosium compound and dope it into a diamagnetic system and spread them all out but yeah we can't do the um the sort of nitty-gritty read one atom store one bit of data at the moment that's who knows how far in the future and and, and, a, and not strictly a, a chemistry only problem but a bigger science uh, issue to address okay i think we are running out of time so that's i think we'll wrap up the questions right now okay um so if there are more questions, uh, there are more questions obviously in the chat, but uh, unfortunately we can't answer that uh, due to time constraints and there's another meeting coming up uh, for material chemistry. So um, thank you, Dr. David, for your time and like thank you for coming along as well. And thank you for everybody who came along as well. And I'll close this room shortly, but before we let us, let before we go, we want to remind you that you can submit a piece summarizing this talk if you want to. Uh, look at your emails. The remind email has the information for this, and this is only available for school students. So school students in the sense up to like A-level students and those who haven't entered university yet. So I am going to close the meeting now. Thank you everybody for coming and thank you very much, Dr. David, for your time. Thanks very much to everyone for coming, yeah. And if you have any questions you, that you didn't get answered, you can always email me. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone.